So um, this is a talk by uh, Loop. Um, so Loop um, uh, has been working uh, for the IT industry uh, over 20 years, over 25 years, sorry, and then switched to uh, creating open source IT educational uh, materials. Um, and um, that was five years ago. And since then, he's been teaching IT open source. Um, and um, he's going to talk um, to us about um, his uh, hands-on experience um, with embedded Rust programming. For is yours. Hi, good evening from Singapore. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, uh, fine. Yeah. Good evening, this is uh, Lab. Okay, so today we'll start with a story. We'll make it fun and casual. Um, these stories actually based on real events that happened earlier this year, right? Uh, we, our story is about a learner and a teacher. Uh, we'll call the learner part of one, and we'll call the teacher sensei, right? So what happened was that uh, one day, Pada wanted to make some fancy new watch face that looks like this. So is this thing here, okay, that you see up here, right? So sensei says, that's easy. Uh, here's a watch face. So we have a watch face here, uh, and also you can see it here, I think. Uh, it looks like this. So why don't you take this program and change it? Right, so part one, good thing is that he knows some Arduino, so he just goes and changes the, the program. Right? Now, let me explain the program a bit uh, for those of us who are not familiar with C, because uh, there's a bit of um, uh, complexity here. Now, so there are three lines here. The first line of the program says that uh, we create a buffer of six characters, right? We format the date and time, Okay, uh, two characters for the, uh, sorry, format the time, hour and minute, two characters for the hour, two characters for the minute, right? Uh, and with a colon in between. Now, because you're programming in C, there's actually a uh, terminating down at the end. So when you add two characters, two characters, colon, and now you get six characters, right? <coughs> so that's why we have buffer six characters here. Um, now, and we call this function here uh, to set the label on the watch face like this, right? So, Padawan goes on and tries uh, programming this whole night, uh, but fails. So the next day, uh, Padawan goes and asks Sensei, right? I'm really sorry, this program is acting really, really strange. All I did was to add two new lines and everything went strange, right? So Sensei looks at the code and sees and knows exactly what's wrong, right? Um, he sighs, it's 2020. You know, there must be a better way to learn a better programming. Now, what happened was this. Um, you see that Sensei just simply copy and pasted the code, right? And added in two new lines here, right? Uh, but um, that's the problem you see, right? What, what our part one doesn't realize is that uh, there's two characters for hour, two characters for minute. Right? You add in two new lines here, that's altogether six characters. Um, and when you add in the terminating null, that's seven characters. Right. So we have a problem here. Uh, when we write seven characters into a buffer of six characters, um, you get a buffer overflow. Right. So that's a really bad thing to have in a C program. Once you have buffer overflow, you know you write to some strange memory, uh, and strange things will happen. So Sensei asks, you know, what you have is buffer buffer overflow problem. Do you know what that is? No, Padawan says, no, not really. But may I ask some questions? Now, because it's C, uh, Padawan will start asking lots and lots of questions. Things like, uh, for example, you know, why is this? Why should it be seven characters instead of six? What is a stack? Uh, what is it terminating now? Right? What does it need space if it's a now? Right? Uh, what is S print have to? Uh, what is percent zero to D? How many characters is that? Um, is uh, backslash n one character or two. So the trouble you see is that we are doing a lot of micromanagement, and uh, when we drill down into character by character, and we need to allocate every single character, um, it, it gets really problematic for 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 newbies. Right? So Sam is wondering, you know, how how could a simple watch face become so complicated? Right. So. Um, Sensei takes a different approach. Sensei says, tell you what, let's code this the safer way with S and printf, right? Um, so what we do here is that uh, we call, instead of calling S printf, we call S and printf, right? S and printf requires a, a buffer and a buffer size. And this is how we pass in the buffer size. Now, uh, of course, Papadam was asking questions, you know, what's S and printf? Well, so there's a long story behind that. Uh, well, to format something for printing, we call printf. You know, for, to format something into a string buffer, we call S printf. S stands for string. To format something into a print buffer limited by size, we call S n printf. You know, uh, because n is the size of limiting. 
and to get the size of the string buffer, we call size off. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, it's in C for all these years, but um, it really, really baffles uh, newcomers. After a while, there was total silence. You know, Sensei asking, are you still there, part of one? So what happened was that um, a part of one has slipped away to play Fortnite. Yes, the game. Part of one never returned to embedded programming ever again because the experience was just so bad, right? So if you think about this, well, whose fault is it? Well, I think it's actually the sensei's fault, you know, bad sensei. Sensei failed to provide a safe and sensible environment for, for learners to experiment with embedded programming. So in other words, it's a trap. Ah, right. So it, we, we don't want these kind of traps uh, in learning situations. Um, if you think about it, uh, let's compare embedded programming with Fortnite, right? Embedded programming, you wonder, why do people want to go through so many hoops to flash to the device, you know, uh, then crashing, and then after that, doing coding again, flashing, and crashing again. So eventually, they just give up, right? Uh, because uh, they have no other to turn to, and they, they have no idea what goes wrong. It could be a buffer overflow, it could be something else. Uh, but you compare with a, a game like Fortnite, right? I've actually tried myself. Um, you just, it's easy to play, you just drop in. You know, you shoot, yes, uh, you may get killed, but then you respawn, uh, you do that again, and you get better each time. Right? So if you compare the two, um, embedded programming is a really bad game. It's like dropping into a game, and the first boss you, you face is the really tough boss, and the boss is called Buffer Overflow. Right? So it's a little wonder that people actually give up on embedded programming right? and play games instead. So today we're going to talk about a solution for that. Um, our solution could be something called a scaffold. This is a scaffold, um, the way they use it in Hong Kong. Um, we use it in construction. We use it for building things, right? So it prevents you from falling, it catches you. At the same time, it helps you to move out level by level, right? So that's what a scaffold is for. Um, but if you look at the instructional term uh, for scaffolding, there's actually something called instructional scaffold. Um, it prevents learners from falling into traps and never getting out. It guides the learners towards more difficult topics one step at a time. And we don't feed them all the skills one big chunk at a time. Uh, we give them small bits so they can learn. Oops. So let's consider this, this way of doing it. Um, we have a, uh, a, a Rust program here. Um, we, we, let's make this scaffold out of this. Uh, in the Rust program, uh, you can see that things are a lot structured and a lot uh, uh, nicer. Let me explain why. Um, firstly, you see that uh, when we have variables that can be changed, uh, we have to declare them as mutable, M-U-T. Right. Mutable means that this thing can be changed. So we declare variables as mutable here, and we pass them uh, as mutable like this. Right. So there's no doubt that this thing uh, is, can be changed and will be changed. Right. Now, the next part is that uh, we, have, um, uh, we have macros. Um, this macro here, uh, right, right uh, you know it's a macro because it's exclamation mark. This is a macro um, that will check the type of each parameter. Now compare that with uh, sprintf. It's just passing in the format string. Um, it may or may not check the types. Uh, in Rust, uh, it actually enforces the checking. So it will make sure that our matches the first format here, but the minute uh, matches the second format here. Right? Um, the compiler will fail uh, if the formats don't, don't, don't match. That's the power of using a Rust macro here. Now this part here, expect time fail. Um, it's a construct that's commonly used in Rust. It says that if this uh, function fails, uh, we will just simply, you know, uh, kill the program, halt the program with an error message, time fail. So there's no chance that this code here can overflow the buffer. If it ever overflows, it will just simply fail with a time fail error. Um, we have, uh, 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 we can call C functions. So we're calling C LVGR functions in C uh, to set the label. Um, it works very well with Rust, so it's interoperable. Right. Um, there's a slight complication here because uh, we are we're dealing with uh, strings in Rust which are not now terminated, but strings expects strings uh, C expects strings are now terminated. Right. There's a question mark at the end. Uh, this means uh, error checking. So uh, there's mandatory error checking in Rust. If this function fails for any reason, it returns error code. Um, this whole function will just exit. It will not proceed. Right. The whole this function here will exit from the error. So um, mandatory error checking is really a nice thing in, in Rust that's not really enforced in C. 
Uh, and one last thing, you see that uh, we don't actually uh, put in types of variables. You don't say car, or you don't say buff, we don't say uh, string. Um, uh, we just use let. Right? So this is a very easy way to create um, uh, variables in Rust because Rust will infer the type of variables for you. Now, um, so let's go back and compare the two versions of the code, uh, C versus Rust, you know, to create this watch face here. Um, and you can see amazingly, there's actually a one-to-line, a line-to-line uh, line -line comparison. Um, it's, it's, it's a match. Um, the differences, well, instead of going to specific types like car, right, uh, we, we go into, uh, we, we let Rust do the inference for us using let. Um, you see that the sprintf is quite similar to right here, right? Um, well, okay, so there's a stack complication with the null here because of the way strings work in C versus Rust. Uh, we see that there's extra error checking here. So in case the buffer overflows, it fails. Um, and this part is here is also quite similar. And at the end here, we have also mandatory error checking. In case uh, this function fails, uh, this whole function terminates in an error. So if you really think about this, um, why don't we use this as the introduction to C? It's, it's friendlier. It doesn't have traps, right? Um, uh, it, it's, it's really safe, right? If you ever overflow a buffer, it will give an error message. It won't suddenly give you strange problems. So I actually see this as an introduction to C programming. So maybe the right way to do things could be to you know, start new programmers on Rust. Eventually, when they're more experienced, they go into this kind of C programming, which is more, uh, more technical, uh, more in-depth. And Rust can get, actually get a lot safer. Um, so safe that some things C programmers won't even catch. Um, you may have noticed that there could be a problem here, right? So set text is some external C function. We're just calling set text, you know, to set uh, the, the buffer on the watch face, and we are passing a buffer. But what if the buffer lives on a stack, like early on? If the buffer lives on a stack, and we pass it to the set text function, and set text saves that buffer pointer, uh, we have a problem because uh, later on, when this function exists and set text tries to access that buffer pointer in future it will crash. It's actually accessing some memory that uh, that's not used out there, um, that's not valid. So um, this code here, in fact, will not compile in Rust. Rust will fail to compile it. Rust will call it a lifetime error. Lifetime because um, buffer lives on a stack. So it's a shorter lifetime than set text, which is a, you know, a, longer, a much longer global lifetime. Solution is that uh, Rust will insist that we create a, a static multiple variable like this. So it lives in static memory, not on a stack anymore, and then we pass it in there. Right? Now, here comes another interesting problem. Um, think of, if you think about it, if we create static buffers, what if we have two you know, riot threads, and these threads try to access the buffer at the same time? We have a problem, because this uh, behavior is undefined. We're not sure you know, what's the value of the buffer going to be like. Right? So in Rust, uh, we have to declare this code as unsafe. So it's something that we flag out to the Rust compiler, telling it that, yes, we are aware there's a problem here, right? Um, and uh, therefore, it's up to us to, to resolve it, right? Uh, if you're uh, creating this on, on Riot, uh, we have to make sure that we'll use the right kind of Riot primitives uh, to ensure that there's only one Riot thread executing this code at one time, right? So Riot is basically something that, uh, you know, the compiler can't really assure, but it's really up to us. It's our responsibility to make sure that uh, this code is safe. Now, moving on, uh, what we've done so far, um, I hope you can see this demo here. So this is uh, uh, Rust on Riot, uh, right? So it's actually a uh, real Rust OS uh, with a layer on Rust on top. Uh, this was uh, based on the port of Rust, uh, Riot to uh, PyTime smartwatch uh, created by Mr. Cohen Zandberg. It's an excellent port, has got lots of features in there. So how we structure this is that uh, there's a layer on Rust on top. Uh, with the uh, watch face application, and everything else below is in C. So Riot is still in C, right? The whole operating system still runs in C. Um, so note that we are not trying to change the whole system into C. Um, we are just using Rust for the application parts and C for the, the so-called mission critical parts. Um, now, uh, our, Rust, our Rust watch face is compiled as a Rust static library. Right. Uh, this is something that we compile with a no STD convention. No STD is special. Uh, it's actually meant for embedded platforms. What it means is that uh, there's no heap, right? There's no dynamic memory, 
anything you create must go into the stack or it must go into static memory. So we also support strings and vectors, like in standard uh, version of, uh, of, of Rust. Uh, however, uh, in NoSCD, or what we call the core version of Rust, the core Rust library, um, uh, we don't have those heap-based strings and vectors. Uh, instead, we use heapless versions, meaning that our strings and our vectors will all live um, in static memory um, uh, or on a stack. Uh, they will not be used of heap memory. Our watch face will call a uh, some C functions in the LVGL uh, UI library you know, to create the widgets, the labels, the buttons, and so on. The way we do it is that we create interface uh, using a tool called bindgen, right? Uh, so um, that allows us to call uh, LVGL functions safely from our Rust face. So that's how we set uh, you know the the, the 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 time and date on the on the watch face. Uh, we have a app framework here, a very simple app framework uh, created by Mr. Zenberg uh, that handles most of the um, plumbing uh, for Riot. So the multitasking, the touch controller, the display controller, that is done by the app uh, framework. Right. Um, and um, everything else here in the Riot is the same, no changes. So all we change is just putting a Rust on top. So you might think, uh, why Riot? Um, well, I feel Riot is good because it's a modern and better OS. Uh, modern means that it's easy to code, right? It doesn't have long and strange function names. Uh, it has a strong and friendly community. Um, community is important. Uh, we have lots of um, newbies coming into our uh, Pine Time chat room asking for help to do coding. Uh, but um, you know, if they have nobody to turn to, um, they, they'll just give up. So this is why uh, community is very important you know, for, for for doing uh, this kind of, uh, supporting this kind of coding. Uh, and most importantly, uh, we have the freedom to innovate on Riot. So I really hate to say this, but um, on certain embedded operating systems that are, are mature, right, uh, you find that uh, you know, they're more focused on stability, um, they're more focused on uh, business as usual. Um, they're actually afraid of putting in things, right? Um, but not a problem with Riot. I see that uh, Riot uh, is, is friendly enough for us to innovate by putting in Rust. But we have lots of gaps. Um, so this is just a framework. Uh, there are lots of pieces missing. Right, um, and we need your help to grow Rust on Riot. Right, um, the the thing is that uh, we 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 have lots of coders, lots of other ones, you know, lots of learners coming in to use this platform here, uh, but we don't have a good platform for them to do coding. Right, so that's where we need your help. Now, um, okay, so here's a bad pun. So you know that Star Trek is a hollow tech, you know, the, the, the 3D uh, simulator. Well, we have one uh, in our universe. Uh, it's called a web assembly simulator. Right? All it does is that it creates this watch face uh, in a web browser format uh, using web assembly uh, that you can do quick testing and development. Right? So you can see that the structure is quite si similar. Um, all we did was to swap out some parts here. So most notably, we swapped out the, uh, the, the part in the middle here, the inscription part here. Um, uh, uh, we actually use this to replace the Riot part. We integrate with the web browser uh, through the HTML canvas um, and calling a date time functions with JavaScript. So all this runs on WebAssembly. All this runs on JavaScript. So which is actually quite interesting. What if someday we could run um, Riot in WebAssembly altogether? That might be an interesting thing to explore. Uh, but for now, yes, we have a demo. Uh, up. You can actually click this and see a watch face. Okay, I'm sorry it looks a bit different from that because um, styling issues. Uh, there are some styles in the new version of um, uh, LVGL that we can't backport to the old version. Uh, and we have source code for that. So all this code actually runs in the web browser. Now, let's explore the possibilities with Rust. Right? Can we do things simpler? Now, with LVGL, things become very granular. Uh, we have to go in and set, you know, uh, the width and height, you know, uh, by actual pixels, you know, by X and Y coordinates. This is really, really tedious. Is there a way to do this, you know, in a declarative way, um, like this? So layout in a table with columns and with rows, right? This is actually very much uh, like HTML. So what I'm doing right now is to take a uh, declarative UI framework from Rust uh, called Druid. Right. And then changing Druid so that it renders with LVGL. So uh, we can hopefully one day create uh, watch faces very easily with this format here. Um, another interesting thing that we did, um, we've got a declarative UI with Druid. What if we match it up with Blockly? 
Blockly is the it's a variant of, sc of Scratch, right? Um, so what we can do is that now uh, we can just drag and drop the code blocks, and uh, the code here changes. So this is a lot of interesting stuff that will really engage you know uh, newcomers uh, to coding. Um, here's another interesting use case that we have. Let's say I go, I'm going to the, the beach or to the park, right? Um, I want to make sure that my family members and my pets don't wander off too far away from, from me. Why don't we give each one of them a watch like this, right? Uh, and it measures the proximity between devices um, using Bluetooth mesh. Great application for Bluetooth mesh, Riot and Nimble, uh, the Bluetooth, uh, the open source Bluetooth stack. Um, but there's a catch. Um, it, it's actually very hard to write Bluetooth mesh programs. This code you see here, you know, it decks really all it needs, you know, to build a Bluetooth mesh program. 2,700 lines of C code. Um, can Rust on Riot simplify this? Rust has got something, has got really powerful macros that will allow you to create domain-specific language. So perhaps we could wrap out some of this code and create a domain-specific language, you know, to express all this code, you know, just a few lines of Rust code. Um, and by the way, the tooling, uh, this, you, know, you notice here that we're using VS Code. Uh, so these are tools that we, we, we support uh, with Riot on Rust. Uh, you can write a code in, in, uh, for Riot on Rust using VS Code. You can uh, build code here. You can debug and you can flash it. So it's all a very friendly environment uh, uh, for coders. Now let's look at back at this again. Um, compare the two, right? Uh, how, how can we beat this, right? Why don't we try to build something that's actually better than Fortnite? If you think about it, uh, Fortnite has a fantastic user experience. It works on all kinds of platforms. I tried it on Nintendo Switch. It works on Xbox. It works on PCs. It works on mobile phones too, right? It's easy to install since it runs on cloud, right? It's really quick and responsive. Not much waiting involved. It's not hard, right? Uh, you, you learn. And most importantly, there are no traps that you can't recover from. It's easy to learn, easy to improve your skills. It's really hard to beat Fortnite, but maybe we can try. Um, so the good news is that unlike virtual things like Fortnite, okay, the, we, we have physical things like these. These are all physical things that we, we wear, right? That we carry a, a carry us in public, right? And in fact, with now the pandemic going on, uh, people can't even see our faces. We are masked out, but yet they can see our, our watches, right? So if my watch is flashing red, you know, I'm in bad mood, don't bother me, right? So this is something that our learners could wear and it could something to, that will engage them, uh, that will show them that, you know, I've created this watch race, I created this app, you know, I can flaunt it. And this could be a good solution for people who outgrown Arduino. So today we've got people who've done Arduino programming. They've done lots of sensors and Arduino coding in C, but after a while they get stuck. How do you upgrade from Arduino? How do you bridge a gap from Arduino to the real world, right? Um, this could be the solution, a hackable smartwatch. Um, and if you compare the two, you know, Arduino, we actually wire up sensors ourselves, you know, and actuators, and then we experiment with them. Why not just simply experiment with the sensors inside the smartwatch? So we've got a whole bunch of sensors here, just use it. Uh, and we've got Bluetooth mesh capability, so we can even take a bunch of um, uh, Pine Time watches and just wire them up, talk to each other. Right? And you get a sensor network right out of the box. We got a nice screen and nice battery. So um, we think there's a chance that maybe Rust on Riot could be the next Arduino. Uh, it could be uh, something that uh, newbies will learn you know, and, and wear on, on the on, on the wrist. Uh, we need a solution that's easy to code, easy to build new firmware, easy to flash. And we've got lots of plans. So for example, uh, we have a workflow that's running in GitHub Actions that will build the whole um, uh, uh, Riot OS for you. In fact, it will also build the web assembly uh, uh, simulator all in the cloud. So no installation required, just like Fortnite, right? Um, and uh, when it's done, it will just simply flash to your uh, watch uh, over Bluetooth, right? So this could be something that we, we could, you know, uh, market as the next version of Arduino, or the, the, the new Arduino, right? Uh, but we need lots of people to make this happen. We need Riot developers, we need Rust developers, we need testers and writers, lots of volunteers. Right, so this is my last slide. So, you know, uh, today we live in very strange and uncertain times. Um, what is the new normal for IoT development? These pogo pins here, uh, you see, cost me $100 to ship from Singapore to US, right? It's ridiculous. If we can't get real hardware, uh, could we test on simulators uh, and verify on real hardware remotely, right? So, um, now, uh, one thing about the story which I said earlier on about, you know, Padawan and Sensei, well, it's actually real. Uh, Padawan, in real life, located in a different part of the world from Vin, right? He codes in the web assembly simulator that you've seen earlier uh, without a smartwatch, right? And I 
Okay, I'm the one who actually takes the, the firmware and flashes it for him. So in fact, uh, you see these little pictures below here. Uh, these are the firmware that is sent to me for testing. Right? So we're actually doing this remote testing. Uh, it works quite well. Right? So I think now is actually a great time to, to rethink and reconstruct the way we teach IoT you know, to a new generation of distracted learners like our Padawan. Right? And in real life, our Padawan is still hanging on to C. Uh, today is still waiting for me. Uh, it's waiting for a better way to code because C is the way most people code. But you know, could Rust on Riot save a part of one, you know, and bring him back to embedded programming? Perhaps, right? So please come join me. Uh, together, uh, we make this happen. You know, we'll, we could make Riot on Riot uh, become the next Arduino. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Lou. <laughs> uh, um, big uh, applause. Um, so. Um, the floor is open for uh, for for questions uh, from the audience. Um, um, other questions? Uh, I see already some some well, quite a, a deluge of uh, uh, thanks in the chat. Um, so there's a question from uh, Nicola Arel. Um, <clears throat> uh, Nicola, do you want to ask your questions on the audio, or should I read it? One, two, three. Okay, I'll, I'll probably read it. And uh, so, don't you get bigger binaries with Rust compared to uh, same program with PC++? Um, and if yes, uh, don't you consider this as a drawback? So, uh, mm -hmm. especially in embedded systems. Okay. Yeah. So this is really quite interesting. Um, uh, I, I hear you know a lot of perceptions from people that Rust is actually quite big compared to C, but it's not. Um, Rust, if you think about it, is a low-level language. Um, it's not a dynamic language like, uh, say, Python or Go. Um, everything, in fact, uh, remember we said that we're using the no SCT convention, heapless, no heap. You know, everything runs in a stack and uh, uh, or static memory. Uh, and if you look at the way that this code is laid out here, um, and if you compare the code generated, it's actually quite similar. So, which is why uh, we say that Rust is a system language. Um, it actually creates code that's quite comparable to, to C. Um, um, so I wanted to produce some stats uh, to show you that the, the, the code generator is actually quite small. Uh, maybe I'll put it into the, uh, uh, the uh, my uh, GitHub repo uh, uh, someday. Uh, there's an article in there about porting uh, watch traces from C to Rust. I'll put in some stats about uh, how much space is actually taken up. I've done Rust on Blue Pill, uh, so it's actually quite small. And uh, this platform here is definitely much more powerful than Blue Pill. Um, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the evidence that it's actually quite small. Yeah. I guess a, a, um, a subsidiary question is like uh, not just uh, the uh, size, but maybe also the speed. Like, have you have you measured like uh, difference in speed? I mean, there are more checks in in Rust, I guess. So did you measure anything um, noticeable? Right. So um, now, uh, Rust uh, is based on LLVM. So it has got lots of interesting optimizations uh, that will really speed up. Uh, now, uh, but you notice that I'm also focusing on just the high level stuff. I'm looking at um, uh, the top layers here. Um, at this level here, probably speed wouldn't matter that much um, because you're not doing a lot of uh, busy loops. You're not doing a lot of um, uh, data crunching. Um, you are just doing apps that will just, uh, you know, they'll just be run once in a while. Most of the work still is done in C. And I think this is a good approach. Uh, Riot has been developed by so many years uh, by a very by experts in the community. Uh, it's mature. Uh, so let's leave it as that. It's optimized. It works well. Let's leave it at that. It's just that there's some code up here uh, to build an app in, in C is actually quite tedious. So I'm suggesting, why don't we build the apps in Rust instead? You know, give give it a gentle introduction you know, to, to embedded coders. One day when they're ready, they will learn C and then they can extend the Riot to do you know, things that they want to. Um, so um, so in short, um, uh, Rust is, is got a pretty advanced compiler based on LLVM. Uh, secondly, we are focusing more on application aspects where maybe timing is not so sensitive. Yeah. Okay, so there are more questions in the in the chat. Uh, one from uh, Philip uh, who asks, why why did you choose to use uh, Bluetooth Mesh um, instead of uh, IPv6 over uh, over BLE, for example? Um, okay. 
That's a good question. Uh, frankly, I haven't considered IPv6 because I thought it was kind of heavy. Um, I've done mesh programming on NRA 5.2 in C, uh, so it works. It's just that the code is crazy complex. So I thought of uh, just reusing that code over. And besides, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the watches like this, they, they probably work better on um, Bluetooth with, with, with mesh uh, without adding all the extra layers. But I'm, I'm open to ideas. So. Uh, on a different device, maybe on um, you know on on something that's got network, something that's Wi-Fi like ESP32, that probably works better. Uh, but on this, maybe mesh works better. But I'm, I'll put the suggestions. Um, okay, next there was a question from Frank who's asking, what's the biggest challenge um, you faced uh, getting this uh, off the ground? Uh, was it uh, working with the time time hardware or or the the C code um, um, or the other rest uh, aspect. First, I have to qualify that Mr. Zandberg did a great job. So he created a whole bunch of this stuff that actually worked well. Um, I just added the layer on top here because I thought, um, you know, we got serious problems with educating new coders. This could be a solution. Uh, but um, but let me explain the kind of difficulties I'm facing. So. Um, uh, the Rust community is kind of complicated. Okay, um, yes, I'm surprised nobody has asked me, but uh, let's talk about it. Uh, the Rust community, when you talk about embedded, it actually goes the other way up. So instead of using Riot, uh, they would have their own bare metal kind of drivers. So they have drivers that run on hardware, you know, and there's something that's close to an operating system that handle tasks and so on. Um, so that's the direction that's going up uh, that that Rust embedded is taking today. I'm taking the approaches down. So going from apps all the way down to the framework, you know, maybe someday we'll put some Rust bits into the operating system, but not there yet. Um, so this is actually a very new approach. Um, so um, it's tough for me to figure out by myself, you know, what's the right way to do it. I'm not really a Rust uh, expert myself. I've been doing C for many years. I teach C. I can see the problems. So therefore, I was thinking, you know, why don't we try to experiment with Rust to make it safer? Uh, because C has really got too many problems with pointers and all that. Um, so what I'm doing right here is actually very new. Uh, it's not validated. Um, so that's where if there are Rust experts around, I really appreciate your help to help me, you know, check. You know, is this sound? Is this the right approach? Um, even though most of the most of the Rust folks are doing this way up. Yeah. Okay, there was um, um, another question from uh, Yel. Um, how do convince uh, the make files uh, from Riot to link to Rust binaries. So I guess. Uh, um, um, I've, I've, uh, so I guess. <laughs> okay, that could be a question that we can take offline, but uh, it's in my repository. I have a full working Rust on Riot repository that does a build. Um, so there are actually two steps. It builds the, the, the Rust library. Uh, as a static library using the cargo command. And then after that, uh, this produces a, uh, a static library. So I just link that library uh, with the uh, uh, Riot OS itself. So Riot pretends that this is a library uh, and Rust generates this library. So that's a simple way of integrating it. Uh, but you can check my repo for the details. Um, we have time maybe for one last question. Uh, um, I think uh, Benjamin wanted to ask one. Oh, uh, yes. Um, I see that, um, well, I've been following uh, the Pine Time work a bit, and I see that there's a lot of uh, implementation on various framework. framework. Uh, do you see uh, one of the frameworks, uh, well, uh, I mean, taking the lead, or is it going to be Riot, uh, or, um, or do you think it, it will stay this way, I mean, kind of diverse and... Ah, so I, uh, there's a question about firmware, right? The different flavors of firmware. So, uh, is that did I hear the question correctly? Um, well, it's it's about the different frameworks used in uh, uh, for frameworks. the pipeline. Okay, frameworks. Uh, like today, so, so, uh -huh. go ahead. For example. So, um, so do you think Riot is going to be leading uh, the well, I mean, as a solution, or uh, or is it going to stay quite diverse? Uh, yeah, so uh, we support diversity. Uh, we are not forcing anybody into a single framework because, um, you know, frankly, there's there's uh, the, the the options out there. There are many choices out there. So uh, there's no reason to 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 force anybody to use a specific one. Uh, but for your information, um, out of the box, uh, 
uh, the new uh, the new shipment of Pine Time will be shipped with uh, free RTOS. So free RTOS, uh, we branded it called uh, Infinity Time, right? Uh, that's created by my great friend JF. Uh, he maintains that. Um, we have another implementation that's coming out based on uh, Zephyr. Um, uh, we got, we got the Wasp OS based on MicroPython. We've got Arduino, ATC Watch. So we got the uh, and we got you know one uh, another Rust one based on Minute and Rust is called Clock. Um, so we 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 embrace diversity. Um, what I'm concerned about is more about um, the community. So uh, these frameworks um, are kind of led by um, individuals or maybe a small team. So uh, they have limited bandwidth in terms of um, you know growing them, right? Um, so I was hoping to tap on the 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 right community because uh, we've got lots of really brilliant people in the right community and the Rust community. Maybe we can get together and really you know, do something great because, um, uh, frankly, I have concerns about sustainability. You know, we've got lots of interesting firmware, yes, but whether they're sustainable in the long term uh, really depends on the kind of interest that we get and depends on the kind of developers that we get. So, so today, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we can do that with the, the Rust community, the right community. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I propose we uh, thank uh, Loop uh, for his nice talk um, and uh, this really nice application. Um,